It's a leadership development webinar, the basics of chip seals, understanding the what, why, when, and where. Um, you all are on mute right now. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the question feature um, to submit any questions. We will try to answer them um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, today we have Stan Williams with Ergon who will be presenting this webinar. Okay, thanks Ali. This is Joe Brandenburg. Um, I'm the co-chair uh, for this committee. Uh, Jamie Wing is my is the other co-chair for the uh, the committee. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today because of uh, stuff going on at work. Uh, but uh, so most of you know Jamie Wing from Ingevity. Uh, she's a, a great co-chair, and uh, she was very upset that she couldn't make it. So she wanted me to tell you all that and that she was sorry. So. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and kick it off for Stan. I'm going to go ahead and read his bio, and then I'll let Stan take over. Uh, so, and, and first, Stan, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. All right, Stan has worked for Ergon Asphalt and Emulsions for five years as the technical marketing manager for Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. He is actively involved helping agencies and municipalities implement pavement network management and peer preservation principles. He also provides technical assistance with product evaluations, project support, and forensic investigations. Stan helps with teaching construction best practices, data preservation treatments, and specification development. Stan obtained his BS in civil engineering and MBA from the Mississippi State University. He is a member of APWA, ASCE, Mississippi Engineering Society. Uh, all please welcome Stan Williams, Morgan. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joe. Can can you hear me? Um, somebody can hit a chat or something. Let me know. Can, and do you see my screen? Yep, you're good to go, man. All right, great. Uh, thanks for thanks for letting me be a part of this. Uh, these are some some crazy times that we're uh, that we're going through. So this is really kind of one of the first one of these uh, these type presentations that I've done. Uh, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy and that social distancing is working for you. Um, I'm, at, I'm at my home, so I have bribed my kids to uh, stay out of the house and stay off the internet. And But I apologize if you hear them or any of my pets that that may, uh, may make noises in the background, but I guess that's just the time and age that we've, that we've got right now. Uh, it's it's really weird for me to be speaking to a group of people and not being able to see them. Um, it's awful. It's it's hard to tell if you are if you have questions or anything. So uh, do use the chat function or I mean uh, the question function. Um, if you do have questions and we will we will try to get to those as we go through. If not, we'll try to answer them at the end. Um, it's kind of funny not not seeing you. I guess I wouldn't be in, uh, insulted if y'all fall asleep. And I'm kind of comforted in the fact that you can't see me with that because I really need a haircut, something bad. Uh, but let's let's get started. Uh, let's see here. Why did that not advance? Okay. All right, guys, just a second. All right, what a chip seal, what is it? There's really a kind of a common uh, definition for chip seals. And a chip seal is just a surface treatment that's used in pavement preservation that combines a, a layer of asphalt binder with a layer of embedded aggregate. Um, a, chip, a chip seal is not very thick. It's basically the thickness of a chip seal is about the, about the thickness of the maximum size aggregate particle that's used. Uh, in the process, so it's not thick. Uh, you can you can say probably three eighths to a half inch, sometimes three quarters of an inch, just depending on the, the size of the rock. Uh, chip seals came about in, a, in really about the 1920s. Uh, they were originally used as wearing courses uh, to cover low volume gravel roads, uh, so that traffic weren't weren't driving on the gravel anymore. They were driving on these chip seals, um, but Today, due to their low, low initial cost, especially compared to things like thin asphalt overlays, chip seals have become really successful treatments to, to treat 
everything from low volume road, uh, county roads to high volume pavements. Um, the main thing is that you've got the, stru the structural capacity to be able to handle the loading of the, of the traffic of the exist on the existing paper. Um, one of the things about chip seal is their cost that we I just mentioned. And if you kind of look at national studies of uh, things, the uh, call, uh, kind of an average cost nationwide is around two dollars and fifty cents, maybe two seventy five per square yard. And that's really going to depend on uh, the availability of the material, the location, the contractor availability, specifications, time of year that it's bid, whatnot. But it's it's um, it's price is is significantly lower. Studies have found that uh, it will save you forty five to fifty percent of uh, in life cycle cost compared to a mill and fill. So they're they're pretty they're, they are uh, pretty helpful when it comes to managing your money. Uh, other names for chip seals um, chip seals are also known as stone and oil or tar and chip. Uh, around here, where I'm from, uh, bituminous surface course is, is what they're often called, or asphalt surface treatments, and then seal coats. All right. Basically, the, the procedure for a chip seal, it's pretty simple. After you've prepared your, your road surface and you've got it clean and set up your uh, traffic control, you basically take an asphalt distributor and what some people will call a tack truck and you just spray asphalt uh, on the ground and then you follow that by uh, a piece of equipment called a chip spreader which drops uh, the aggregate down into the uh, the hot asphalt from there a roller comes over and seats that asphalt down into the I mean seats that aggregate down into the asphalt uh, after it's cured and 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 gain some strength, then you'll follow that with a, a broom and sweep off any loose material. And um, that's that's basically the procedure of how, how an asphalt works. You can kind of see this, uh, this diagram that we have here. The idea is to drop the chip into the asphalt and if you're using the asphalt emulsion, uh, when it's still when it's still brown, you want to you want to drop it in there as soon as you can and then roll it and roll it down to about a depth of about 50% uh, embedment down the, of the stone down into the asphalt layer. Uh, and, then, and then as it cures out, traffic will embed it down the, the rest of the way. Let's see if we can make this video work. Here's a video of a chip seal going down in the neighborhood, which is a little unusual. At least it is in my area. Um, this, this county did this and won an award for uh, their pavement management um, of where how many of how they were able to use progressive treatments like using a chip seal followed by a microsurface uh, here in this situation but they used a chip seal to treat the the cracks that were that were beginning to show in this in this subdivision and then came over the top of it with a microsurfacing to give it the good smooth texture that everybody would like to have especially when they're walking and pushing baby strollers and riding roller blades and bikes and things like that um, but it's not uncommon for uh, chip seals to be used in combinations with other treatments. Uh, one of probably the most common uh, combination treatment that is used in my area is just a, a, a standalone chip seal surface, like you see down in the bottom left of the of your slide there, and it is. Um, uh, then sprayed with a fog seal, and then then it will be striped and stuff. So that's that's basically the the most common. And basically, the purpose of that fog seal is to is to just add another light layer of glue of asphalt. So you're helping just secure that any loose rock that may be not completely glued in uh, when it was dropped in the first time. So you're just coming from the top. Plus, it adds a good color contrast and stuff. So that's probably the most common that we see. Um, other other ways that, that people will combine this treatment is with is what they call a cape seal, where they'll come over the top of it with a uh, a chip uh, with a they'll come over the top of the chip seal with a microsurfacing or with a slurry seal. And what you'll do is that that chip seal will will help um, 
seal any small cracks that are there and it will help delay or retard uh, reflective cracking so that the, it really makes that, uh, that, that microsurfacing and that scrub seal stand out and, and last, last longer. And then the, the, the last way, or, the, or another common thing that, that is used around is a chip seal with, as an inner layer. And what, what they'll do there is they'll put a chip seal down and then they will come over the top of it with a, uh, with a thin lift. Um, I've, I've seen uh, projects where states would, would put a chip seal down on a four lane, a four lane highway, and then come back over the top of it with uh, a one and a half to two inches of overlay. And the reason why they, they liked doing that was but because they were sealing off cracks and helping to delay the reflective cracking, but they were um, they were also able to leave structure in the road. They didn't have to mill it up. And one project that I'm familiar with in North Mississippi that they did, uh, it was 19 miles worth of four lane. So it was almost 80 lane miles of chip seal that they put down for this inner layer where they came back over the top of it with two inches of, of overlay. They were able to save over a million dollars of their milling cost. Uh, so it was, you know, they were, they got a lot of bang for their buck, buck by doing that. And I would say probably now in this state, and I, I live in Mississippi, uh, I would say that over the last two years, they've probably done 70 or 80 lane miles of chip seal inner layers. So, um, One of the other things that's common with a chip seal is to have multiple ap applications of a chip seal. What we normally think about is just dropping one single stone uh, and that being the final uh, surface. In fact, you're probably going to hear me say a lot today to, that you want this during application, you want it to be one stone thick. But what is what will happen a lot of times is people will come in and put down one stone thick of layer and then come back over the top of it with another layer. Uh, doing that twice is what we'll call a double chip seal. And generally what that consists of is a larger stone that they drop down first. And they'll, then they come back and drop a smaller stone on top of it. And that serves for a couple of purposes. It adds you another layer of glue down there on top of that rock. But that smaller rock will actually nest down and seat down in, in between the, the valleys and grooves of the large rock and help lock down the rock. So it helps lock it down. And then that smaller rock provides for a smoother surface, uh, riding surface, which is not as, which won't be as, as loud or as noisy. And I've been on jobs in Georgia that have had uh, a triple seal. And that's basically the same process where they took a large stone and then a medium stone and then a smaller stone, which this was actually about the size of, a, of sand. Uh, that final is what they call a sand there in Georgia. And, had I not known what I was riding on at the time, I would have thought it was an HMA. It was, it's really smooth and it's really quiet, but, but those are how that you can use uh, multiple applications of, of a chip seal. And then really kind of the, the last thing about a chip seal is that you can use uh, treatments. You can do a treatment over and over and over again, uh, as long as that the base is, is good structure. Uh, we've got roads I'm in my area, where I, I work, Arkansas and Louisiana, Mississippi, where that agency has maybe treated that road four, five times in the last 20, 25 years. So they, it's, a, it's not a process that can only be used once, it can be used over and over again. So why, why do a chip seal? I'm sure if, you're, if you've been around uh, pavement preservation, if you've heard any other kind of pavement preservation um, presentations before that you've probably seen a curve like this. And what you're looking at here is the pavement deterioration curve. It's the red curve in the middle of the, in the graph here. And what it represents is the condition of the pavement over time. Um, basically, the day that you put uh, an asphalt pavement down on the ground is the best that a pavement will ever be. Only as time goes on, as time moves to the right in this graph, uh, the pavement only deteriorates, it doesn't get better. 
Uh, so what, what you would like to do is to be able to come in and treat that pavement uh, before it falls off down the curve to the right. The farther you go to the right, the more expensive treatments are to, to maintain and, and, and keep a pavement in good shape. So what you would like to do is be able to treat that pavement when it's uh, relatively inexpensive to do that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a chip seal is, is a pavement preservation treatment. And as you can see in this chart here, it's, it's best that we try to uh, use this pavement earlier uh, along this curve. So you, you really wanna use a chip seal to get the most bang for your buck when, a, when the road is still in good to fair shape. Um, you can't really use a chip seal to glue a road back together once it's lost its structure and the base has been damaged. Um, I've been on, I've been, <laughs> I've been on project investigations before where people were complaining that something wasn't working with, with one of the projects and or one of the products or materials there. And we go out and look and, and they were just spraying um, asphalt all over the road and dropping rock in it, even though it was mud, you know, they were just spraying it directly on top of mud and in potholes and not fixing anything. So it's not, it's not, it's not a cure all for that. It's, uh, it's made to treat a road that's in, in fair condition. So what, what is the purpose of spraying an asphalt? The, the purpose is to, uh, to seal the fine cracks um, that, are, that are in the existing underlying pavement and to hold and glue down the rock that you're gonna drop down. Now the purpose of the rock that you're dropping down is to uh, protect the asphalt layer because the asphalt is sticky and it'll get really sticky in the summertime and if you don't drop something in it to provide a riding surface then uh, it will it will pick up and get all over your car and stuff like that so you want to you want to provide a good a good uh, riding surface but you also want to uh, to provide a material that is skid resistant um, driving driving directly on um, asphalt that is in the winter time or when it's been raining or something like that is a can be a driving a braking hazard so the the rock actually adds a, a skid resistant surface to help with braking so that that's that's why you do it um, the purpose that that people will put it down it like I mentioned a minute ago was to seal the small cracks and and provide a waterproof surface uh, to protect the base from water intrusion. You know, that's, water is the number one enemy, enemy of a road surface. Because once water gets down into the base and softens that structure, then that structure, that road will begin to move and move around under load. And once the road starts moving, that's when you start to get, see cracks, bigger cracks, and then potholes. And, and, um, that to, and so you, you want to seal those cracks to prevent that from happening. Another thing that uh, chip seals can be used for is to stop oxidation. As a, as a pavement gets older, it gets more brittle. So I'm sure we've all seen um, asphalt that, that was put down and it was when it was put down, it was, it was completely black, but after a couple of three years, it started to turn uh, gray. That's just, that's known as oxidation. And, and as that happens, pavement is getting more brittle. Well, what that does when you put a chip seal down you are stopping that oxidation right in the pro right where it stopped right there uh, so the sun has to start back over on a new layer um, by doing that you're going to extend the service life of a road now depending on when you put a chip seal down if you put a chip seal down when the road is in good condition you may get seven to ten years worth of life extension out of that road uh, if you wait till road, the road's already got a lot of cracks and potholes and some base failures, you, you may not get but one or two years of life extension out of the road. But uh, on average, I think you'll see, uh, if you look at several studies and things, that you'll see that the service life extension by using the chip seal is usually five to seven years. Uh, we've already kind of talked about the skid resistance. Uh, another thing a chip seal will do for you and why you might want to use it is that a lot of times as the road gets more brittle, gets aged, it'll start to lose the rock. And 
really, if you think about the road, you're not really driving on asphalt, you're driving on the structure of the rock. The rock is what keeps the tires, you know, that, that structure, that rock is important there because it gives it its strength. So you want to keep all that rock there. And as rocks start to peck out and, and, and leave, you want to glue those back down. So that's what another, what a chips it will do is it will stop that rattling from happening. And then I, I mentioned something earlier is that a chip seal will also stop reflective cracking. So a, a lot of times where you'll see where somebody will come in and do an open. Hi, Stan, this is Allie. Are you there? You know, as, as with any kind of treatment that you're doing, um, as with any kind of treatment that you're doing, helping the customer um, or the agency that you're to understand that the purpose of a chip seal is to seal cracks and protect that road from uh, letting water and stuff get in it is, is the best thing. Um, you want to make sure that they understand the payment preservation uh, principle that the right treatment at the right time. On the, the on the right road at the right time. Uh, there's a lot of things that will affect the the quality of a chip seal, and and whether or not it, it goes down well. And that's really the like we've talked about the condition of the existing surface that you're putting it on. Uh, but uh, there's other factors like the people that are involved, um, what kind of experience that the contractor has, uh, the type of equipment and the quality of the equipment that he uses. Has he kept it calibrated and in good condition? Uh, the materials that they use, the the application on the way that they put it down, um, the traffic that is uh, that will be riding over the road will affect the quality, and then the weather, the time of year, uh, will all all affect how. And we'll talk a little bit about all of these uh, on how well you get a good chip. Set. Now, some of the things we talked about, some of the things that a chip seal uh, could be used for. We'll talk about some that that you don't want to do. Uh, keep in mind that a chip seal is not going to strengthen the under the uh, the the pavement, <clears throat> the existing pavement. If that pavement has got base failures, if it moves around, um, it it's not going to strengthen it. You you can't take a chip seal and glue a road back together that's that's completely lost. Uh, you can't really increase the bearing capacity of a road with a chip seal. Don't don't think that you can go put a chip seal down and then drive heavier heavier uh, loaded trucks down it. It's it's not made to add add structure, add support. If you've got a rough uh, road that's that's really rough out, that's not smooth, that's a chip seal is not going to smooth out a bunch of bumps and and things the chip seal will actually mirror the underlying underlying pavement. Uh, it's not going to create any kind of major cracks or potholes or anything like that. Um, chip seals are not really made to bridge cracks wider than an inch and then a quarter of an inch wide. Uh, if you do have in, uh, cracks that are bigger than a quarter of an inch wide, and you want to use a chip seal, then you'll need to pre-treat those with a uh, with a crack seal. And then if you then maybe if you've got a road that's just got a high percentage of of cracks that are that are wider than a quarter of an inch, you might need to look at another treatment, maybe something like a scrub seal, uh, which is very similar to a, a chip. But you'll want to uh, you want to look at something else. And then keep in mind that a a chip seal is not intended to be a permanent solution. Uh, like we mentioned a minute ago. Uh, the life expectancy of a chip seal is is you know five to seven years in good when when you're putting it on good to fair road so you know it's not it's not meant to put down and then come back 15 15 years later now i'm familiar with roads that have lasted chip seal roads that have lasted 15 years uh they've been fortunate but that's that's really not the that's really not the goal of every time
I uh, just wanted, wanted to throw this slide in here to just say, um, you know, sometimes there's ideal candidates and, and that would be to, to use it on a surface with no, no cracking and a good strong base. I've said that before and it's just an important um, point to remember. But a lot of times people will use it um, on fatigue, you know, cracked pavements, things like that, and they'll have good success. But keep in mind that, you know, you want to, the cracking doesn't need to be too big and things. And then I've, uh, in my area, a lot of, a lot of paved, uh, unpaved roads and stuff have actually been built up over time with chip seals uh, to provide a surface uh, for traffic to ride on. Now, the, uh, the, the type of pavement that you're looking for, uh, like we mentioned, is that it needs to be structurally sound. And that another thing is that it doesn't need to have rutting over uh, an inch, over a half inch deep. And, and that's important because uh, gravity will affect a, a chip seal, I mean, a, a affect an emulsion or just like it will affect water. Once you spray it out on the road, it's going to go to the lowest uh, the area. So what that means is when if you're on a road that's that's heavily rutted and you spray asphalt on it, what will happen is the the asphalt will rut, will go down into the valley of that rut and up on the top part of that rut, there won't be enough glue up there to hold the stone. So it'll actually flick flake off, and then down there in the valley, uh, the the depth of that asphalt can be so much that the stone will actually get covered up and what that what that will lead to is a is something called flushing or bleeding uh and during the winter during the summertime that can be a big problem because it actually means that the cars will will ride through it and it'll stick the asphalt will stick to the cars um you want to you want to make sure that any roads that you do it on that do need repair that they've been repaired and patched and that those patches have been allowed to cure uh if you if you patch something and you and you haven't given it time to cure completely out then you need to pre-treat those patches with some kind of fog seal or something uh because a lot of times those fog seals i mean those um patches have voids in them and th what will happen is those voids will uh if you don't fill them up with the with the fog seal or something like that, what will happen is that that chip seal emulsion will will be absorbed down in into the patch, and instead of having like I like like I like to say instead of having glue up on top of the patch, it's down in the patch so the rock won't stick. I've been to a lot of jobs where the rock stuck all over the road everywhere but the patches, so it just leads you to believe that those patches had not been properly cured out and not been uh, compacted like they should have been and that there were a lot of voids in there. Uh, you want to make sure all the roads and stuff are good and clean and relatively dry and, and a really important thing is to make sure that you've got good proper drainage for your roads um, and make sure drainage is one of the number one things that will damage, will damage uh, the integrity of a road. So you want to make sure that everything will drain away. I've, I've um, I'm aware in some places, I think it's like Minnesota that they there's been times where they have actually uh, paved a road and come back two years later and and then sealed that road. Not they didn't wait five, ten, or five, seven, ten years. They did it after two years because they found out that that was just an economical way to to protect that pavement while it was still in really good condition and really extend the life of it down the road. So um it, it doesn't have to you know like i said they used it up there at the high end of the curve but always remember that that there's no no road is any better than the base that it's built on so if you if you chip seal a road that's in bad condition it, you may not get good results you know a lot of times i can get called out to a job site and ask what what's happened and why something's not working and what we'll find out is that the the road was really misdiagnosed and it, it should have been a uh, rehabilitation than, than what it was, than a, a road that should have, that had a chip seal put on it. You know, though, you can't always avoid those conditions, but a lot of times trained people can, can locate those areas and, and make adjustments to make things work. So uh, just keep in mind that, you know, 
it's better to use a, a chip seal early. And then I mentioned there earlier that that um, chip seals can be used on a variety of roads. It's not uncommon for in, in Texas and in, in Minnesota, places like that, that they'll actually use them on their interstates and in, in highways. I know uh, a lot of where I'm where I'm from that a lot of times it's used on low volume county roads, things like that. So there's they can be used in a whole lot of different places. And then we've we've kind of already mentioned all of these that they can be used to increase your skid resistance. They can be used to uh, stop your raveling, uh, stop oxidation, and seal cracks that are less than a quarter of an inch wide. So what materials make up a, a chip seal? We've already talked about spraying an asphalt uh, and dropping rock in it, but what does that really consist of? Uh, the asphalt can be um, a hot AC. Uh, it can be a cutback or it can be an emulsion. Now, a hot, um, a hot AC is just basically what it sounds like. Hot, AC, uh, hot asphalt cement that is heated up to around 350 degrees, I guess, and then and then sprayed out on the road. Uh, the, the, the reason why a lot of people will use this is because you get very quick traffic returns. As soon as that, uh, as soon as that, asphalt cools down then it's pretty much reached its full strength uh, a lot of places we use this for roads with high high volumes of traffic uh, the problem with that is that because you're using asphalt that is so hot that it's it's people have concerns with safety issues and it's uh you have to be really really tuned in with what you're doing because you don't have a whole lot of room and a whole lot of time for any error uh, when you're using hot ac I mentioned a cutback. A cutback is basically an asphalt cement that's been diluted with a diesel or some kind of distillate. Um, it, they, they work really well, but a lot of places are getting away from those because of the, nobody likes to just spray um, distillate on the ground and, and let it evaporate anymore. So uh, due to the environmental concerns, people have quit using those or don't use them as, as often. And then the last and probably the most common, especially in my area, in my three states, is, is using an emulsion. Uh, conventional emulsions are things like RS, uh, what you'll hear terms like RS2 or CRS2. Uh, they're just, um, they're basically a little bit of asphalt, a little bit of water, some um, chemicals in there to kind of keep those things from mixing together. And they spray that on the ground, the water evaporates, leaving the asphalt. Uh, you'll hear, uh, other uh, nomenclatures like CRS2P or HFRS2P, that P indicates that they've been uh, polymer modified. And uh, they've, been, they've been polymer modified. And what, what happens there is um, the reason why you want to use a polymer in there is that the polymer will help that asphalt binder be less, um, less soft in the, in the hot weather and less brittle in cold weather. It helps uh, traffic. Uh, you're able to get traffic back on the road faster because it will help with the, the binder to, uh, to cling on and, and lock down that rock faster. It has increased strength faster. Um, and a lot of times people will use it when they want to use like a larger chip size or something like that, but it, it is more expensive. So because it's got more different, more, uh, chemicals and stuff in it so people so that's why some people don't use it but but it actually sometimes will help you so those those are really kind of the three asphalt materials that are used in a chip seal um you know one of the the main things that you want to make sure when you're using asphalt material is that it's that it will be liquid enough that you can spray it out of the distributor um and that it will be thick enough on once it gets on the road that it will actually hold the rock uh, the specifications will vary by state or region on, you know, what type of material to use and at what rate you should apply it by. The, the other material that you're going to use here is an aggregate. Now, the aggregate um, has got to be durable. 
Uh, it's not, it, it can't be a, a durable that is, I mean, it can't be a, an a stone or a rock that is gonna uh, break up or compress under the, the loading of traffic. A lot of times people will use a limestone or a crushed gravel. You wanna make sure that that aggregate is crushed uh, and that it's washed. And uh, you'll see a lot of terms as, as though as cubicle or something like that. What you want is that it, that rock to be a lot of the same size with angles in it so that those angles will be able to lock together and, and help hold that stone down. Uh, I've been on a lot of jobs where people have tried to quote unquote save money and they would use a washed rock or a washed river rock or something like that. Uh, it's just a smooth pea gravel and the asphalt just doesn't stick very well to that smooth rock. It doesn't lock together and it just will flake out. It just comes out. Uh, so in the long run, they ended up costing themselves a lot of money because they just wasted everything that they had put down. So I don't suggest using a smooth rock. I, su I suggest using a, a good durable um, crushed rock, uh, crushed on all sides. And then because you're using a crushed stone, a lot of times that rock can be dusty. You want to make sure one of the most important things you can do for a job is to make sure that that, that, that rock is very clean. Um, rock that's got a lot of dust in it, uh, that dust will actually stick to that asphalt first before that stone will, and then that, that rock will just flake out. It's a common problem where I live, um, happens a lot. And I basically tell folks, if you can stick your hand down in the rock pile and pull it out, and it looks like you've got a uh, powder on your hand, then you've got too much dust in there. So you wanna, you wanna make sure that that thing is clean. Uh, another important um, tool to use to have a successful chip seal job is that you want to make sure uh, and use a mix design. Um, I wish that that was a requirement everywhere. Not every state um, chooses to, to do that. And I just see better results when people have a starting point and know what materials that they're going to use beforehand and have done a design for it. I have been a part of um, testing where people will, um, where we've taken different um, aggregate, all from the same, all from different quarries, all meeting the same specification. Uh, they all met the same gradation uh, range, and every one of them required a different uh, shot rate when you when you went in and did a design on them. So the difference in those those aggregates between the high end and the low end was over a tenth of a gallon difference. Uh, and what that meant was to this project, what that meant was had a contractor picked one on the high end or one on the low end, he would have already been out of spec or he would have already uh, had a problem before he got out there. He might have had a bleeding road or he might have had chip loss. Uh, because he was either shooting too much asphalt or not enough and every bit of that rock was in quote unquote in spec so it's just important to to do a chip uh, a chip seal mix design to make sure that your uh, your materials are compatible compatible that they will that they'll work together uh, and that you know that they'll that they'll be with it just gives you a good start and then understand that when you're out there on the road, that road conditions may not actually even, even change a little bit to the where you have to adjust, adjust your rate up or adjust your rate down, uh, depending on the condition of the road. Uh, it's just a, that that mix design is a starting point. It's it's not a in a do a, a be all design, but it gives you a place to start. Uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you're spraying. Um, too much asphalt down there for the rock that you're using because now you're you're creating a situation where it might bleed. Uh, but you don't want to get in a situation either where um, you've dropped so much rock that you're wasting money on rock. Uh, you're actually you're actually better off not to drop too much rock uh, because that's that's a waste of money and it's a safety hazard. You can cause vehicle damage, um, and then having too much rock is it is actually detrimental to the surface 
to the to the surface of anything that does stick it'll actually knock out knock out any loose rocks will actually knock out rock that's been embedded so you don't want to do that so you need a kind of a starting rate on what what to drop out there um but but keep in mind the, the goal is is to be able to take a chip and embed it about halfway down into the into the asphalt after you roll it. That's what you're kind of shooting for. Now, sometimes if you've got snow plows and things like that, you might need to go a little deeper. Uh, let's say in Georgia, you might need 50% embedment of your stone down in the asphalt, but in Minnesota, you might need 70% uh, because you're going to have, you know, snow plow equipment and things like that riding on top of it so you know that those are things to take in, into consideration uh, another thing to take into consideration is the volume of traffic that's going to be going over it uh, that will affect on how much um, how much asphalt that you need to shoot for the aggregate aggregate that you use but it, i think it's really important to use those it just gives you a better chance of having a good job All right, the, the equipment used, uh, like we mentioned earlier in the process, is that um, it's just you use an asphalt distributor uh, truck. And as you can tell by the pictures there, that some of them have been around for a long time. I feel like some of the jobs I go on with the way that the contractor had maintained his equipment, that uh, it looked closer to the one down on the bottom of the page than the one on the top. But you want to you wanna make sure that probably one of the most important things you can do uh, if you want a successful job is to make sure that your asphalt distributor has been calibrated, that you're using the right nozzle sizes, that they're all turned in the right direction, that your pumps are, are actually pumping the, the right amount of uh, material, uh, that all the nozzles are working and that you're getting a good uniform coverage across the width of the road. Um, that That's one of the most important important things you can do. I've been on jobs and talked to contractors where they have never calibrated their their equipment and they wonder why they have problems. And you ask them, you know, why don't you calibrate your equipment? And they're like, well, we just we just don't have time. And you're like, but you're on the side of the road trying to figure things out. I mean, it's just it's just a, a simple thing to do. Uh, Another, uh, the next piece of equipment that is used is the chip spreader. And again, another piece of equipment that is really important uh, to be calibrated. Uh, you wanna make sure that this piece of equipment is dropping uh, a uniform layer of rock. Like I mentioned earlier, you only want that, uh, that stone thickness to be one layer thick. You, want, you don't want a whole lot of rock piled up on top of each other. What we like to say is that it, you want a salt and pepper look. Um, when you're standing down and looking straight down at the at the road after the uh, chip spreader has come by, you want to see about 20% asphalt and about 80% rock. And that what that does is that gives you some voids. So when the roller comes over the top of that thing, it allows that rock to to fall over onto its flattest side and get nested down into the asphalt. Uh, so you want to make sure that it's only one stone thick. It's not so thick that it's got a whole bunch of rock on it. Too much rock will actually destroy what you've put down. So you want to make sure that you have it, that you're not putting down too much. Uh, the next piece of equipment is that you would like to, that you would like to have a uh, a rubber tire roller. Uh, it's generally best to have at least two of these. Some people will actually try to have three for the sake of time. Um, but you want to you want to make sure that um, the reason why it's why people suggest rubber tire rollers is that steel wheel rollers will can crush the aggregate that's down there, causing your problems, knocking chips loose instead of and by breaking it up. And then also, if you have if you do have slight um, slight rutting and things like that, then a steel wheel roller will ride across the top of the rut and it won't compact the, the material down in the rut. So it won't compact everything across the, the width of the road. So that's why you wanna use a, a rubber tire roller. You wanna use a good moderate speed. Um, and then once, one, one of the things I forgot that's important about a chip spreader is that you wanna keep, a, well, we'll talk about it in just a minute, but you wanna make sure that that your your roller is 
used at a moderate speed, that they're not going too fast, that they're always moving. Uh, but then once the uh, material has set up, that you get the, the roller off of it because then you'll then you can do harm. So you want to get it, you want to use it and then get off of it. Then the, really the kind of the uh, next piece of equipment that's important for a job is to is to have a broom uh, or, a, or a vacuum truck or something like that out there. Uh, like I've mentioned, excess chips can dislodge chips out of the uh, out of the surface, and that's important because those loose chips end up flying up in the air and breaking windshields and things like that. So you want to you want to be able to go in and get all those loose chips off. If you're in a uh, in a neighborhood like that video that I showed earlier, then a vacuum truck is advised. People don't like to see loose chips in their yard, uh, and it's also hard to clean up. Uh, uh, gutter pans and things like that. So vacuum truck is advised there. Um, but if that's not an issue, then using a, uh, a broom that's got a, uh, a good um, broom that's able to be raised up and lowered down, a good cone structure in that broom, that, that's important because uh, you want to be able to, you don't want to sweep a, a road so hard right after you put it down that you knock the chips out of it. So you want to be able to lightly sleep, lightly sweep um, when you first put a, a, a chip cell down, normally you want to wait about an hour after you put, um, uh, after you drop the chips to give it time to uh, build some strength. And then, and then if you have to lightly sweep it and, um, but the best time is to come back the next morning, especially if you can keep traffic off of it overnight. Uh, the best thing to do is to come back the next morning when the, when the binders, when the temperature is cool outside, when the binders had time to, to uh, toughen up and then come back and sweep it with a good firm, a firm broom. So that's important. Other pieces of, of equipment that you'll have out there will be uh, dump trucks, front end loaders, transport trailers. Uh, the dump trucks are important. Uh, they, are, they are what feed your chip spreader as it's going down the road. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're the right size and that you have enough of them. Um, if you have too few uh, trucks, then you'll always be stopping and starting, and that's that's not a productive way to do things. You want to uh, make sure that um, on the on the trucks as they're coming down the road, they really act like your first roller a lot of times. So you don't want those trucks driving in the same wheel path. You want those things spread out um, to help seat that rock down into the emulsion. Uh, that's just a good practice to do. You want to make sure that your uh, front end loader is uh, kept in good condition, uh, that it's not dragging the ground and, and things like that, that it's actually uh, keeping the, the stockpile well maintained to load your to load your trucks. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, applying the application uh, process. You know, the, really the, the first thing that you want to make sure that you want to do is to go out there and prepare the road. If there's any kind of uh, base failure or anything like that, any kind of patches, you want to go out there and get all those uh, filled up and allow, you want to do it early enough that, that those patches have time to cure. Like I mentioned, I really like it when people do it in about, do their patches in about October and then come back and chip seal the next May. That, that gives it a whole winter for things to, to work on that patch. A lot of times that's not uh, practical, so sealing that patch is just the best way to go um, with some kind of fog seal or something like that. Um, any kind of any kind of cracks that are wider than a quarter of an inch, you want to make sure that you uh, that you fill those if you can with uh, crack seal material, preferably about three months before a chip sealing job. Um, that, that'll just help you help you with that. You want to remove way, uh, raised pavement markers um, from the job. And, and any kind of uh, pavement striping that is that is new or really thick or something like that, then that probably needs to be removed as well. Uh, another important thing is the binder, you know, on the binder, you wanna follow the uh, manufacturer's um, recommendations. Um, or, or, and, or, and follow the, uh, the, spec, the specs uh, and the chip design as best you can. 
Uh, you don't want to cheat on the amount of asphalt that you put down. Uh, I've seen a lot of times where um, a contractor will, will bid a job and then run right at the low end of that spec range and the rock come loose. And that can be that can be really expensive. So you don't really want to cheat yourself on oil. Remember, you want to you want at least half of a chip embedment when you uh, when you drop that after rolling. So other good practices to use out there when you're uh, spraying your binder is to is to use things like paper joints and things like that so that you have good clean surfaces and you're not spraying asphalt with it where you don't need to. You need to cover up any utilities. Uh, with uh, roofing felt and stuff like that to protect them. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that when you spray your, uh, your asphalt that, it's, that the temperature is the right time. Uh, it's generally in most areas that I, that I serve, it's 70 degrees and rising. Some places will be uh, a little cooler than that maybe, but it's not suggested. Uh, if, you spray a, if you spray asphalt down when it's 70 degrees and that at night it got it gets down to let's say 40 uh, you could have problems with rock loss so you want to watch that temperature i, I try to um, advise uh, our customers and things that if if it's going to be a cool night if it's going to get below 55 or 50 degrees not not to uh to chip seal that day um you just want to give that that material time to cool uh to cure out Like I mentioned, you want to drop that aggregate as soon as you can. So what I what I tell contractors a lot of times, just to just to express the point, is I like to tell them, hey, um, hey, you want your your chip spreader bumping the back end of your distributor. Uh, I've been on jobs where uh, the distributor driver, asphalt distributor driver, uh, thinks he's in NASCAR and he just hits the gas and drives off out of sight, and then the chip spreader break down. Well, now they've got a problem because they have a whole lot of asphalt down on the ground and no way to drop the chip, chip in it in time. Um, I've been on other jobs where the asphalt distributor driver and the, um, and the chip spreader operator uh, were mad at each other. They wouldn't talk to each other. And so they wouldn't communicate and they just they constantly kept getting farther and farther apart. And then something happens to the chip spreader and he can't spread any chips and the rock doesn't stick. So it's it's important to keep that distributor driver, I mean, that chip spreader as close to that asphalt distributor driver as, per, as possible. Uh, it keeps, pro, if there are any problems, it keeps them small. Um, it's better to have a little bit of asphalt down in front of, and, and not covered up than to have a whole lot of asphalt down and not covered up. So you wanna keep it close together. Um, the, the next thing that you wanna, you want to do when you're coming through there is to have that roller as close to that chip spreader as possible. While that roller is ro rolling over the top of that that rock, you want that that asphalt um, to still be pliable and soft and stick and and not cured out yet. Once it cures and you and you come over it with that roller, you're liable to actually pull that rock out of the out of the surface. So you want to you want it to still be. So you want to keep those three pieces of equipment as close together as possible and then you want to get off of it and 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 uh, let it set up and let it cure you want to keep traffic off of it as long as possible uh, especially heavy trucks uh, stopping and starting traffic you want to keep that off of it uh, as much as possible uh, those are all things that can that can damage your road uh, weather is important the time of year uh, it's not uncommon for uh, a lot of states to use uh, seasonal limitations like they might not let you spray before uh, march the 31st or, or after october the first something like that to just ensure that the temperature is the right is in the right has the best chance to be there in the right area of 70 and rising uh, you want to make sure that when you do go out and measure the temperature you can see in this slide that, that they're using a uh, a temperature gun you want to shoot the temperature in the shade in the areas where it's where it's cold or the coolest. Uh, I've been on job sites where uh, a road would have would be open for a stretch to the sun. There would be no trees and stuff around, and then you get in an area where it's got a lot of tree cover, and 
all the places that had a lot of shadows and things like that, that rock would turn loose, but you get back into those sunny areas and that rock would stick. And it was on the same day that they put it down with the same material and, and everything, but it was just too cold in that area. So you wanna make sure that you've got, you know, that you're doing it in good weather. Uh, you don't wanna do it when rain is in the forecast. There's a good picture of what can happen that if that material is still really soft, uh, rain can wash all that, um, that uh, asphalt off the runway, which can lead to rock loss. It also, uh, high humidity days, things like that can actually cause uh, it, it longer for the asphalt to kind of cure and set up. So that can cause you some problems. And then, like I mentioned a minute ago, just keep in, keep in mind of cool nights because uh, that people don't always think about cool nights because when they sprayed it down on the ground, it was 70 degrees, which is nice and pleasant. But at night when it got cold, uh, that's when all the damage happened. So you want to, want to keep that in mind. And then we want to make sure that we maintain good traffic control. One is just for safety first. You want to make sure that uh, that you uh, protect your your workers. Um, but then you want to put up good signs. You want to notify the public um, of what's going on so that you don't have people uh, coming in carelessly into a job site. You want to use uh, flaggers as best and as safely as you can, and you always want to move those along with the job. Um, pilot cars are recommended, and it's best to, to maintain slow speeds to around uh, 20 to 30 miles per hour. Now, you have to be careful, and I like to make sure that people put up uh, traffic cones and things like that on lane separations. I've actually been on a job where they were using a pilot car, and as soon as the pilot car past the chip spreader um, going in Hi, Stan. It's Allie with Issa. Are you there? You want to keep traffic off of that a newly applied surface, like I mentioned, as long as you can. Um, the weather's going to depend on really how long it takes. It could be one hour. It could be three. Um, sometimes people will, the spec will, will tell you what time you have to let the traffic back out there, but it's, it's best just to keep it off as long as possible. And keep in mind that heavier, faster traffic does more damage, so keep it slow. It always, it never fails in my areas where there's a lot of timber companies and things like that, that people will, uh, that, that timber companies like to go find out where everybody's doing the chip seal and then, and then running their trucks, trucks down that road. It seems, they seem to enjoy tearing up a new fresh chip seal. And then uh, lastly, what we're going to just talk about th some things to keep in mind for keys to success is just, Public education, uh, letting people know that there's going to be a job by putting out signs and door knockers and and advertising in the paper or social media or something uh, to to be prepared, reroute their trip, something like that. That's a good thing to do. Uh, pre pre short construction training sessions between inspectors and and uh, construction crews is. Um, is handy to talk about any kind of problems that you might foresee. Uh, that's always a good practice. Uh, I'm, I'm harping again on using a mixed design. I just think that's really one of the best things that you can do to set up to have, have it uh, good success for your job. Make sure you calibrate your equipment and then use good quality materials. Um, uh, if you want any kind of more information, you can go to the uh, slurry.org website and pull down the recommended uh, performance guideline for chip seals and then you can also go to resource.org and look in their treatments resource center and there's a whole lot of information there about chip seals and I thank you now were there any questions Stan I don't see any questions as of right now we have, a, we have a few more minutes if folks want to type in questions in the uh, question box. Feel free to do so. 
um, you know, while you're thinking about the questions, if you have any, just to let you know uh, that we will be having two more webinars this year. Uh, we'll have a webinar midsummer for uh, micro and story best practices, and in the fall we'll have one uh, for crack fill and crack treatment best practices. All right, I think we're good. So thanks, uh, Stan, so much for your time and for your effort. We really appreciate it. It was uh, very informative. Uh, we learned a lot. And uh, you know, we, we thank you for your time and your effort again. All right, thank you.